Hey everybody, welcome to Behind the Scenes, a podcast where we explore the intersection of art, culture, and big ideas. I'm your host, Sean Malone, creator of Out of Frame, creative director for the Foundation for Economic Education, here with our social media director and uh, Out of Frame shorts editor, Paul Nelson, and Jennifer Mafasanti, director of communications for the Libertas Institute, soon to be in Utah. How are you guys doing? Good. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Nice. It's a great day. It is. It's actually not a bad day. It turned right into now. a lovely day. It's uh, we we've not experienced like the tremendously bad weather that November can can result in. So yeah. far, soak so, this in, Jen. We're gonna soak yeah. this in a little bit. I know you're gonna. Oh, it's snowing in Utah. Uh, yeah, you're gonna get uh, drenched in in snow, and to be fair, also beautiful landscapes. So there is that. As yeah. Well. yeah. Trade offs. We are, have are trade offs. We have trees. We do have a lot of trees. You, yeah, Georgia has way more trees, and I do like that. But uh, I'm, uh, you know, Utah has big, big old mountains. Fewer mosquitoes, though. Oh, that'll be benefit for sure. Yeah, but you don't have the Chattahoochee. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, I feel like once we start comparing the natural landscape of Georgia <laughs> to, you know what's so, uh, Utah? <laughs> so surprisingly, <clears throat> moving down here, I didn't know much about Georgia, but mm-hmm. you get outside of Atlanta. And just around the state, there's a lot of it's variety. It's wilderness. Oh, it, yeah. No, it's wilderness, but it's just beautiful. No, it's it's it it's pretty nice. And honestly, I've driven through Tennessee, Kentucky, like it just you know the Smokies and everything. It is it is really really pretty. It is really lovely, and I am sure that I am going to become very tired of the color brown. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's not nearly as green out there. C- certainly, but it's way drier is yeah. why. Yeah, certainly. At in the summer, it's not gonna be yeah. that's awesome. But honestly, the Rocky Mountains in like April, <sighs> pretty I'm, pretty I'm, nice. I'm looking forward to summers it. Summers in the mountains. Yeah, yeah. this that's is that's where it's at. Yeah. This is, I think, um, growing up adjacent to that part of the world. I mean, I did a lot of Boy Scout trips to Wyoming and mm-hmm. and Montana and stuff like that, and 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 a little bit in Utah. And um, you, you know. My wife is from Maryland, and I make fun of her all the time for talking about mountains on the East Coast because they're it's a hill. They're so they're so adorable. <laughs> they're so wee, and not not really anything. But like, man, you get out to to the Rockies, and especially into Utah and Montana and stuff, mm-hmm. and it is it is a different kind of landscape. I'm also entirely. really looking forward to Yellowstone mm-hmm. being like a reasonable long weekend trip. Yeah, we stayed. Um, a lot of years ago now, maybe 10 years ago, my family all did Christmas at Yellowstone. Nice. And um, b- very... At did the, at you the cook Lodge, the Nash- turkey no. in <laughs> the geyser? <laughs> did not. Uh, at, at the National Parks Lodge, actually, mm-hmm. in Yellowstone. My dad's a big fan of that kind of thing. And and um, the rooms in National Parks Lodges, because they're all like WPA projects, are kind of terrible. They're, but that's not why you're there. They're quaint and they're like, you know, an experience that you're supposed to have, but they are also kind of off. Like we've done that in Yellowstone and Mount Rainier and a couple other places. And it's just like, you're like crammed in a tiny box with like a 1920s, uh, you know, twin bed, basically. That's why though. I don't know why. I don't know why we wouldn't modernize some aspects of that, but people like the rustic quality to it. I well. suppose. I don't no, no accounting for taste, I suppose. But but I got super sick. So did my dad. Actually, we were both like had the flu or something like like a day in or so. So we we did some. I did some hiking and whatever. Um, meanwhile, my brother and my mom tried to figure out how to cross country ski, and oh. I don't think that that went well for oh. either. Oh, oh! <laughs> I'd rather be sick. Uh, I was. Yeah. I was absolutely because basically what I did was have hot cocoa by a. Uh, raging fire in the lodge that sounds way and it was pretty awesome preferable and, and maybe had a book or something cross country ski. my mom slid about trying to figure out how to move forward on skis that i was I mostly was, just want to go backwards it seems so yeah. i'm not really sure how i was talking seems. with some of my new co-workers about cross country skiing actually when i was in utah yeah and one of one of them was unfamiliar with the practice. I was like, that's, it's skiing for when you hate yourself. <laughs> yeah, it must be. I mean, I've never been like downhill skiing either. I'm not really a winter sports Ooh, Once, downhill, that's fine. kind of person. Once, and I hated it. Um, but I think it was just because I was ill prepared for snow plow. Snow. Snow plow. 
What? Just I mean, your, I knew how. Your, I took your, lessons. Point, point your toes and slow okay. down. Yeah. Mm. It's things like that, like um, like certain ice skates, roller skates, stuff stuff like where you have to skid to a stop without falling over seems like a really oh, but you feel like yeah. a, you feel like an 80s badass when you come down a hill and you just whoosh. you're I, yeah it, it reminds me of that um like, eddie izzard sketch when he's talking about snowboarding there's two looks looking cool and dead <laughs> <laughs> it's just that feels oh, about right that it's accurate it's sort of right for skateboarding too to be fair yeah, but yeah. yeah i don't know anyway um, you know, this is actually, I, I can segue this in some way. So today on the show, we're going to talk about uh, a time when downhill skiing was much more popular than it is. <laughs> actually, I don't think so. I, I don't think that's true. I think it was just starting to become popular. The 1960s, uh, we're going to talk about Netflix new original miniseries, I guess. I don't know if they plan on doing a I hope second. Not. I, I hope not, too. I don't, think I don't they even know one. what they would do. I don't either. But uh, Queen's Gambit, or The Queen's Gambit, I guess, um, starring um, Anya Taylor-Joy, who I have not really seen in anything else. I know she's been in a couple things. She was in Peaky Blinders. She's in Peaky Blinders, which I've never seen. Um, I used to get called Peaky Blinders by a guy I worked with because I'd wear wear, ivy caps and stuff. Yes. And people would go, Mm. one guy. Hey, Peaky Blinders. I mean, I don't know what you're talking about. What a clever dude. Y- yes. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. But I never I never watched the show. So I, I don't have any context for that. She must have been really young in that show, though. I right? must have been. Um, in any case, she's really good in this. And um, overall, I, I would say I, I really... The, the story is about a, an orphan... Um, girl who becomes sort of is discovered as a chess prodigy and then becomes a you know highly competitive grandmaster maybe I don't know if she becomes a grandmaster in the show but she becomes a extremely competitive world class chess player in the 60s um, in an environment where it is exclusively male chess players otherwise yep Um, in fact before her very first lesson she's told Girls don't play chess. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that that's so. First of all, it it feels a lot like a docudrama to me. At least to me, it did. Yeah. Um, it's sort of set up like this is the sort of biographical story. This is not. It is a completely no. purely fiction story. Um, actually, once I learned that, it actually kind of unlocked it for me a little bit more because there are things about it that are a little bit like contrived or a little bit like over the top or whatever. Yeah. Um, and I felt like for like a biopic, it would be a little bit like obscure if yeah. those things actually happen in real life. But finding out that it was, that it was all fiction, like I kind of immersed myself a little bit more in the story and overall really, really enjoyed it. I thought, mm-hmm. I thought for the most part, it was really, really well done. Um, Anya, um, Taylor Joy, especially I thought was, was fantastic. Mm-hmm. There aren't a whole lot of characters in, I mean, there are technically, but it's so yeah. driven, driven by, by her, her characters. Yes. Yeah. And um, she she carries, she I mean she has to obviously, but she mm-hmm. and what what's so great about her her turn as Beth is that her eyes are so yeah. expressive, yeah, and she's able to just you can tell what she's thinking yeah. while she's contemplating, yeah, doing this horrible thing that she ends up doing or not, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and you could just you just right there with her just like don't do it don't do it don't do it, yeah, and uh, yeah, just and also the amount. of... Because uh, the character of Beth is not emotionally skilled. No. She, she's not a socially graceful creature. No. But um, so the actress's ability to convey just this cascade of emotion in the very yeah. subtlest of, of facial expressions was outstanding to mm-hmm. me. I yeah. was deeply impressed with her performance. I, yeah, I agree. I thought I thought she was uh, really the, I mean obviously I mean, she had to be like you said. I think, you know, this is a story that is entirely built around one person and it goes it spans a lot of her life, or at least several years of her young adult life. And it would be I mean you you couldn't do this. It wouldn't be it wouldn't work, yeah. I think if you did not have an actress who could do 
um, he had the range and, and exp- ex- expressivity, I guess, that, that she has, which is really good. Um, the story itself, once again, I mean, I think is relatively straightforward in a lot of ways. It does deal with some some themes that are kind of darker that we don't, um, we, we haven't talked about a whole lot in here, like addiction, I think, being the main one. As a, as a small child, she's in an orphanage, and I assume... Well, I don't know, actually. Again, especially knowing that this is not actually a true story. I don't know how true this aspect was. But every day, the, the kids in the orphanage are bas- basically being drugged. They're, they're given yeah. vitamins, but it also seems they're like... They're tranquilizers. The, yeah, it seems like they're being given some kind of tranquilizer. Um, and she becomes addicted to that even as a, as a you know, maybe a 10-year-old or whatever. You know? yeah. And so that becomes a big piece of her self-identification as far as... Her skills at chess and her skills in life is like sort of dependent on the, the drug, basically. So even when she becomes an adult and she gets into some of these bigger tournaments, she's turning back towards alcohol and pills and, and whatever to try to, you know, make herself feel like she did when she first started, I yep. think. And it's, it's, that's a dark twist on mm-hmm. this, it on is, this yeah. story. But I don't think that. But it it also sort of rings true to me to a large extent because I think people with, a lot of people anyway with very extreme skill sets and people with, um, you know, I guess mental capabilities that are sort of abnormal in a lot of ways struggle with that a ton. Yeah, and there, I think this is one of those situations. There, there is multiple lines in there in the in the series of talking exactly about that how there is a very fine line between genius and psychosis yeah, and there might not even be a line. Yeah. If you're just a genius, you're kind of crazy. Mm-hmm. So it, it really plays well, with those themes. And, and, and not only the, the mental skill aspect of the genius, but the obsession yeah. with the sport and with yes. becoming the best and becoming better and, and all that. I think, I think that's why, not to not to get out of this too much, but it's it's why I actually really like the movie La La Land, and I know that's kind of um, not it's not everybody's favorite favorite movie. Um, but one of the things I really liked about that movie is how deeply it explores, and Damien Chazelle explores this a lot also in Whiplash too. But this idea of obsession driving mastery of of a artistic medium, you know, in this case a game, but same right like and i think part of a lot of her social ineptness comes from that obsession yeah. as well although i do think it's there's a moment i don't know i want i don't know how graphic i want to be on the, on the show here but like she uh she is with a guy who is a very nice guy and then they're in bed and after you know she just ignores him immediately goes right back to like reading chess books yep same thing happens to her later and she gets offended by it which i was yeah. like well that is completely lacking in self-awareness mm-hmm. <laughs> or like turntables yeah <laughs> so um you know but it's interesting because a lot of the characters in and out of her life are various stages of obsession with the game you know some um you know much much more so um and then some, you know, really not at all. And, and, and how they interact with her, you know, as like a casual chess player versus like, you know, some of her competitors. Yeah. You know, comp- completely different. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Any thoughts on the series I, overall? Yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, other than some of the language and some of the, the uh, scenes like you were just talking about, I could e- easily have seen this on a network yeah. TV station, maybe in PBS yeah. 15 years ago. And I think it kind of speaks to what Netflix is doing across the board, where it's not just these just outland, like Orange is, Orange is the New Black, mm-hmm. House of Cards. They're really moving into every single genre from terrible Adam Sandler movies to made for TV dramas like this and reviving the rom-com. They are and reviving the rom com has been a surprise yeah. for the last couple of years. And so that's one thing I do appreciate about Netflix. One of the few things I appreciate about Netflix <laughs> is that they actually yeah. are trying to give room to people to to explore these things that yeah. have been dead for a while. I, I appreciate that too. And you know, you you brought up the rom com thing. I think stuff like Crazy Rich Asians, which, um. 
I don't know that any studio that I would have... I mean, I think 10 years ago, I just don't even think something like that would have been made. Because I think the rom-com was kind of dead, mm-hmm. first of all. And plus, it's it's sort of niche in a way, or, or it could be sort of niche. And yet, it's super funny, and it's a really, really great movie. But it's... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm surprised by that, too. I think you're right there. And, and sci-fi, too. I mean, I think yeah. there's a lot of uh, stuff like, um, you know... Uh, um, Orphan Black and whatever, you know, and the, Stranger Things, Stranger many, Things and yeah. spawned so many different shows just yeah. because Stranger Things worked. Yeah, for sure. Um, so th- the only analog I could find in the real world, I mean, there are there are a few female chess players that that have been, you know, even in the as early as the 1920s, I guess, actually, there were a few. Um, I, I, I haven't found much in the way of like really very famous or very popular ones. Uh, Judith Polgar is, and I don't know if I'm saying that name right, she's a Hungarian chess player. Um, she's still fairly young, actually. I think she's in her 50s maybe now, um, but became a grandmaster at like 15, Oh, who I believe was the first, I think that's the youngest, uh, she beat Bobby Fischer actually out at being the youngest ever uh, grandmaster hmm. in chess, and she... Uh, succeeded in a lot of she she was victorious against a lot of um, you know really high profile grandmasters as well um, but she never I mean so l- like the the Beth character in, in Beth Harmon in The Queen's Gambit is uh, I mean she's on a whole different level I mean she's like she's world champion I think yeah at the end of the at the end of the series and um, I don't think anybody has has done that um, but so I wonder, it, it, there's a couple things that we could talk about with this. Um, one, I think is just the, the sexism of the era and, and all of that, the aspects of that, that kind of played a role in, in all of this. The other thing too, is that most of her primary challengers are Russian and it does something actually has always bothered me a little bit. It, it happens in Miracle as well in the, um, Disney hockey movie miracle where it it sort of gives a pass to communism a little bit in a way that i don't think it deserves and well it's never a big deserves pass a pass. In this. there's yeah. a lot of big passes in this but so miracle does this too where it basically says the russian players work better as a team as if because they're communist or whatever they're right they're more selfless and they're more the new socialist man kind of thing. Whereas the American players Whereas the prefer Americans, to they're be individualists. rugged individualists right. when it comes to their chess tournaments. <laughs> right, when it comes to their chess, or their hockey, right? Like where you're literally playing on a team. Team sport. Where it's a team sport. I find that to be irritating for a couple reasons. One, because it cuts against human nature that, that is across all cultures. It, it does not... Part of the whole thing that doesn't work with all that stuff is that the... The idea that you could change the system and then create a new kind of human was never true. And it didn't materialize. The, the new communist man, the new socialist man did not emerge from these systems. In, instead, everybody was just made tremendously poor and corrupt and everything went really, really badly. The other thing, too, and this at least miracle does get into this, is that part of the reason these guys played so hard was because they would get shot and killed incentives and sent to a gulag if they did not perform well. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Like these so, are the these are the elite of yes. the Soviet Union. They yes. are the best at what they do and they are identified very early. Yeah. Um for having these oh. talents and then mm-hmm. that is all that they are allowed to for do for their entire lives. For their whole lives. Yeah. And so that's why they get the privilege of yeah traveling the world and competing against people in other countries to put forward that positive face, that victorious face (laughs) of the Soviet Union on the world stage. Well, and and one thing that the early on in the series, and again, they just don't come back to it, is is Beth asks, I forget who she asked, but she asked somebody, one of the people she's with at one of her first tournaments, she's like, well, who are those guys? Um, Talking about, um, um, what's what's his name? Um, uh, Borov, the, 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 Borgov? The, yeah, Borgov, the uh, Russian grandmaster that mm-hmm. is sort of her. 
I would call the, him a foil, he's, but he's, he's the not, best player, he's, in, the he's, he's he's the best the, player player in the world. He's the best player in the world. He's the defending world champion, that kind of defending thing. Defending world champion, who seems kind of ambivalent about being defending world champion. Yeah. He doesn't really want to do this anymore. Honestly, he seems like a pretty nice guy. He seemed fine, right? Yeah. And that's actually an interesting facet about the story. There's no villain here other than herself and her own yeah. addictions and, and things like that. Everybody's and her fine. adoptive her adopted father. father, who's a jerk, but that's about it. I have some thoughts about him. Uh, fair. But probably not so, sure, but on this uh, podcast. <laughs> fair enough. Um, look, Borgov, I don't think, is, he's not a bad guy. He's not, he's just trying to play chess. And honestly, he doesn't even really want to do that anymore. He just wants to play a good game, I think. Uh, he's not a... Just wants to be challenged. He just wants to be challenged. He's not unsportsmanlike. In fact, everybody is, is very, uh, very good. I think, I mean, the, the worst thing that happens is somebody walks away in a huff and doesn't shake her hand. Yeah. Pretty much. I mean, she's probably the one that's the most. Oh, yeah. Sports oh, one. yeah. She she she's, is. She is the rudest character in yeah, this show. No, absolutely. Full stop. Um, but w- there's a moment where she asks, who are these two other guys with Borgov? And, and the guy that's with her is like, well, they're KGB agents. Right. Who will stop him if he tries to. Um, effect right Mm -hmm. we don't really give that much time or attention no and and it kind of just skates past all of that and they also had a great scene where she's playing i think he was a 10 year old russian yeah and and he is so eager to talk to her about drive-ins and is is that real Uh that was a huge moment to me in in that show and she's like and she's like oh yeah all right who cares (laughs) suppose suppose you do become world champion at age 17 or whatever as is your goal what are you going to do then and he does not just understand the mind. question just, yeah just just you can see the smoke come out like yeah. it's <laughs> that's a really good scene too but they never I, come back to it i know no. i think a lot of that and and look the movie's not about that and i or the show it's not yeah. about that and and i understand you know what i kind of want to slip into some of these things yeah. is not always what everybody else is going to want to do and I don't want a preachy show, obviously. Like, yeah. I don't. I don't want a show that like pauses the 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 drama of the chess sequences and every to go tell you how communism is bad. But like, boy, there are some things on the edges of this where you go, like, actually, it's not that great to be one of these these Russian guys. Like, right. It's, it's yeah. not not a good situation that they're in. Yeah, they're. I mean, they're the best in the world. But like you said, Jen, they're they're it's beaten into them from youth. Yeah. There yeah. was also the very subtle implication that the only reason that anyone would oppose communism is oh, yeah. because um, they would oppose atheism. Right. Like, right. communism and atheism are very closely tied together. That's a very Marxist kind of thing. Can't have one without the other. Yeah. yeah. And so... Which you can. Like, turns out. Yeah. Well, it's, you can have atheism, but you can't... Oh, yes. You can't have communism. But... I mean, not according to the church ladies. So yeah, right. Not according to the church church ladies. Well, that is that which, is. So as so, it's just, sorry, go ahead. You know, yeah. it's just like the that the only reason that you would oppose yeah. communism is because you're, you're a good religious good, good yeah. Christian. Yeah. You know that kind of thing. I'm like, well, well actually, that is that is one th- that is that whole story arc really bothered me. Yeah, and. It's not necessarily this was so blatantly bad anti-Christian. It's just over and over. As as a Christian myself, it's just you get inundated with these ideas of Christians are hypocritical. They are stupid. They are they have they 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 have motives that aren't apparent on the surface. Yeah. And while it, this wasn't the worst depiction, it's just yet another of like. Yeah, all these stupid Christians over here, and it just—it just—it gets old. It's not, and I feel well, like. And by the way, they were paying for her to go. Right. Uh, there were, yeah. And and I get not wanting to to say what they have you say, mm-hmm. um, but it's just it's just it's one of those scenes where I feel like it in Hollywood now, oh, it's brave to continue to yeah. make fun of Christians when yeah. we've been doing this for fifty years, thirty years. You know, thirty probably. Yeah. At least. Oh wow. Yeah. yeah. So it's like I don't know about fifty. I'm trying to think. Well, maybe that'd be in the seventies. Yeah. Or seventy. 
It's getting there. Yeah. And it's getting, getting to be 50. And it's, yeah. and it's just, it's just so annoying. And you just kind of let it go because it's just everywhere now. And, but it's just one of those things where it's just, that's not, it's this, this is, it's the stereotype of this huge group of people in our country. And that's, it's okay. I yeah. think it, I think it's really impressive that that one scene would, would manage to uh, insult both Christians and atheists <laughs> at the same time. I was, yeah, I was so, going to say, I don't, I mean, that, that I'll, I'll speak to it from the other side of that, the, the religious coin, yeah. and say, like, I also found it the same, like, well, the communists are atheists, and that's terrible. No, no, the communists are communists, that's terrible. Right. I'm an atheist, very much not a communist. I, I, it's pretty important to separate those two things. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't need those connected, because, like, you, yeah, they aren't. Yeah. And also, I think part of it, and, and part of the reason why I think it's important to understand that it's not all communist governments either, because I think if you look at uh, North Korea and you see Zhusha and you see what they did with, um, with um, the religious aspects of, you know, or even, you know, uh, Chinese, you know, Buddhism and things like that, mm-hmm. which is still integrated into, into Chinese communism. They they tried to integrate the the popular folklore and religions and everything yeah. else into their system. Russians, I'm I'm not really sure why Soviet communism tried to like push that out. I mean, obviously Mao theoretically tried to um, get rid of Christianity and, th- and things like that, but most of that stuff comes down to trying to make way for the state as the as the center. It comes yeah. I mean, right pretty simply. Yeah, I mean, it's a Christian. Yeah. There's no person on this earth that you put above Jesus. Right. So So if you have Stalin. Right. You you, you can't have that. Right. And you right. don't as as I mean, Christians are called or to be Mao's to be a great leader. To whatever. be individuals. Right. You mm-hmm. don't depend on anyone but God. Yeah. And that's a scary thing for someone that is yeah. trying to force people to do stuff against their will. Yeah. And I and I understand that. I, from the atheist side though, the thing that's crazy to me is that I I didn't trade a master for another one. Like that's not what yeah. I. Yeah. It's not where I wanted to go with that. Like yeah. it wasn't like we're like going. Oh, yeah, I don't want this one. But uh, this. But one. I'll take this one instead. No, no the no, whole no. point was like I, I'll figure this out for myself. Yeah, we're out yeah. of that that mentality. But yeah, I mean that's. But that's been. I mean, even when I was in college, I mean, like some of the. It's amazing to me, like how many people I knew who were in the sort of skeptics, free thought alliance kind of territory, who who were like full-on socialists and stuff, like who believed. And some of that too, I think, is also this scientism. I think some of it is is this yeah. belief that you can, you know, if we get rid of the supernatural and the, you know, the superstitious and whatever, we can solve all of the world's problems with science, right? Right. Yeah, you can't. Spoiler alert. Um, that's not how this works. You can't plan things. Yeah. Science has been wrong. Science is wrong. Well, that was, you know, it's kind I of mean, the point like, of that's it. the whole point. That's kind it, of the point of it is to be wrong. Science yeah. is a standing dare, or at least it should be a standing dare that says yeah. prove me wrong. Yeah. That's where I think a lot of what we see even now, the calls for sort of technocracy and like sort of yeah. rule by experts and stuff like that is really, really disconcerting to me because yeah. the whole thing, the whole history of, you know, I mean, I would say the Enlightenment on, but honestly, the entirety of human history is just iteratively proving people wrong. It's iteratively saying yeah. like, oh, we, we've we got a heliotropic uh, or whatever, centric. centric model. Yeah, heliotropic. That'd be funny. No, heliocentric no. model <laughs> of the horrifying. <laughs> mo- model of of the universe. Wait a minute, you know that's cool, but that throws off the geocentric version that we were we were thinking mm-hmm. before. Okay, great. Which one's right? Let's let's figure let's, it out. Let's figure it let's out. Right? Let's let's look at the stars. Let's let's do the math. Let's you know look at let's observe nature and see what's happening, and. It's it's never been the case that like the scientific consensus of this second is flawless yeah. or even close to flawless. I mean, it's no. it's mostly wrong, 
right? That's the maybe the crazier part is that it is actually, apart from some of the fundamental stuff, like it is mostly wrong. Yeah, there, there is, are actually shockingly few natural laws. Like when it comes yeah. to yeah. the way the universe functions. Well, and even but even then, and we even don't then, really when know, you get still, still when you get into right. like there's there's a difference between the way macro bodies behave and when right. you get into like the quantum Atomic structures yeah it so, is it is nuts i mean that that stuff is weird too because you you go there are things brain that bending. We, yeah there are so many things that we rely on as constants right speed of light gravity you know as a force or whatever first of all gravity is also dependent it's, on how far away you yeah. are from a, from a body you know a, a, and what a other mass. bodies may exist around you and, and, yeah so there's just, actually oh, all these man. other things so you might go like 32 feet per second is like the speed the gravity, the pull of gravity, mm-hmm. that's only within like a few miles of the surface of the earth. Yeah. And even then it's fluctuating a little bit. Yeah. So it, 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 the minute that you dive into this in a much deeper way, it doesn't hold up. It, it's, it starts to go, Oh wait, this is way right. more complicated than what's, I thought. What's but, really Go ahead. Um, like I understand the purpose that religion serves for yeah. most people. Yeah. Um, it's something to that that belief that there is a there is a higher power mm-hmm. than you can be extremely comforting. And I'm not saying that that's why everybody believes what no. they believe. I, I want to make this very, very clear. But from a human psychology standpoint, that is one of the big purposes that religion serves. And when you take away the divine from that factor, yeah. from that equation, people will naturally tend to replace the divine with something else, whether I, it's I science or the state or what have you. I think that there is some truth to that, in, in, especially in the sense that people tend to, again, I don't want to say this in like, I don't think, I don't think of this even in an insulting way. I just think of it in as sort of a, positivistic, like this is just a fact about the world kind of way, but people operate in the realm of heuristics, right? Like we operate, we, we cannot make every decision all the time. We can't, we can't, we have to have a framework mm-hmm. of morality, of, you know, of reality, of, of an understanding of like epistemology and, and what we're seeing is real, not real, whatever, right? All of those things, metaphysics, I mean, all, you have to start somewhere with that mm-hmm. stuff because you you literally can't go through life and make a unique decision right. in every single situation. Religion helps people tremendously in building heuristics about the world and building heuristics about morality and w- how you're supposed to interact with other people and and all of those kinds of things. And I think you're right when people get rid of that sometimes instead of thinking through what they believe, they just reach out for another set Mm -hmm. you know um and i think that can be really dangerous with with certain people not i mean not everybody certainly but yeah i mean we've definitely i mean i'm sure you've seen people who've like rejected religion and become the opposite of whatever it was just because they're now just identifying with like the reversal right i mean people have you know everyone's very unique and they have different reasons for believing what they do um, yeah. but what I think what's, what's interesting about our point in time right now with it's a scientific consensus is like, it's basically back when this, the Pope said it, so it's true. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. and, and it's, it's weird because we, the people we that also see that with the state too. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah. And, and yeah. what's, what's weird for me is, is that these people that usually say this are usually not religious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mm-hmm. have noticed this as well. Like there's a lot of people who make strong claims about Christians or about whatever, who are invariably not. Yeah. Which is kind of funny to me. Mm-hmm. Like, I, for me, I, you know, I used to be a lot more sort of militant when I was a kid. And because I've, I've been an atheist pretty much my whole life. And, um, and I used to be kind of a jerk about it when I was in high school. And, and some of that was just growing up in a, in a really religious yeah. area. And, and being in that environment, I was mostly the one being the subject of like people prodding me and whatever like i can't believe you believe this whatever and um 
And so my reaction to that was like to get kind of like combative. Yeah. You know. Um, but over the course of my life, though, I've a I've gotten a lot better at being more um, open to a much wider array of different people's beliefs and understand that like just because somebody believes something differently than I do does not um, does not make mean. A, first of all, it doesn't mean that they're bad. Secondly, it doesn't mean that we don't actually have a lot in common. Right. So we can't get along. The other thing too is I've I've done a lot of work with people for whom religion was a powerful underlying mo- motivating factor for whatever it is that they're doing that have been people running um you know education programs in prisons people who are incredible entrepreneurs serving communities with with stuff that their communities never had before people who've done amazing uh outreach programs and and um you know community support programs and things like that and it's quite often very religious people being motivated to do that kind of stuff. And I've, I've kind of gotten to a point with that where I've been like, there's something else going on there that I don't often see in the atheist world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, so I appreciate it on that level. And now I, I just don't, I don't have it in me to be like a jerk about it. Yeah. Because I see a lot of benefit. Yeah. No, I mean, it's not for me. Um, I mean, just the, uh, intellectually it's not for me but I'm glad that I can be friends with people you know yeah. from across the absolutely yeah. across the realm of that um, it, we're kind of far afield from from Queen's Gambit at this point which is fine but um, that was an interesting thing about the movie to, or the show to yeah. me it's just that so much of it is that's on the edges of a lot of this stuff like again sort of writing off communism is Weird as as not. Did she defect a problem. at the end? No. Why you think? She just got out of the car with her. S- oh, and just started walking down the street. And I don't think so. But it kind weird of felt. Choice. Well, I mean, she said she was going to the. She's going to walk to the airport. But yeah, and then she. But he's like, you're going to miss your flight. But then she stopped and played chess. I know that was actually the weirdest. Sorry, we're we're wild spoiler for the very end. Although I kind of already spoiled the fact that she wins. Spoiler: she wins. A character in a, in a story becomes <laughs> comes out victorious, um, but yeah, the very very end, she's being driven to the airport by her like CIA. She has her yeah, she has CIA guy. handler and her KGB handler. Yeah, and she just first of all, they would never allow her to get out of that car, not ever. No, no. like it wouldn't even be a there would be no question. So, it would not be like sure, okay, why not. He, like, mildly protested. He's like, you're going to be just, late for your flight. And then they just drive away. And they just drive away. And you're like, no, both of those guys would get out instantaneously. Right. And prevent this from happening. But mainly the scene is that way so they can they can have her just go see old men playing chess in the park. I think that was really the point of that scene, though. I think the point of that scene was just, can she have fun? Yeah. Like these old men playing the game. And not make it a... Uh, she's she's the world champion now yeah. can she be can she just have fun yeah right it was just so weird but you're right it, it, did, so it weird. does have like a vibe of like because she's just gonna stroll through moscow now and just stay here just stick around multiple times her handler said you do not leave your room without me you do yep. not open the door without me yep if anybody else talks to you do not talk to them because you might be taken like just mm-hmm. laying out these very real situations yeah and then it's fine yeah it's everyone fine. knows who you are in russia it's now fine. Every, you're you're famous in Russia yeah. because you won at chess, which yeah. is kind of an indictment on communism itself. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is a there is also a moment in the in the show where I forget who it was. But somebody complains about how, um, you know, because they're chess players, they don't make any money or whatever. And and if they were like football players or something, I was just like, yeah. You're playing chess, buddy. Like I mean, she still she still bought a house when she was like twenty. Oh yeah, yeah. She's, she's doing funny. she's doing fine. She on has this. a killer wardrobe, but she's not. She's traveling all over the world, but she's not like, making millions of dollars like she could be making millions of well, dollars. No was, athlete was making million dollars in, no. in the sixties. No, no, but if she was like a basketball star, this is you know. But it's like, yeah, people watch basketball. <laughs> like, yeah, like people actually show up. For games. Uh, so, so did those did those bit. Soviets stand out in the cold for forty minutes between moves? I imagine they didn't, uh, unless 
because the state decided that this was that important that all the journalists had to do it or face prison time. <laughs> it, was, it was just, there were so oh, many boy. weird, it's hard to say, weird choices there. All right. I think we should, we should end here mm-hmm. for the Queen's Gambit. I will just, as, as some closing thoughts for myself, I thought the show was overall very, very well done. There are some things about cinematography I don't love, but, um, and, and certain other aspects of the show that I'm, I'm not thrilled with, but like for the most part, I thought it was really, really well done. I was engaged pretty much the whole time. I know you thought it started a little slow, but I, I think for the most part, I highly recommend this. I think if you're looking for something that's a good weekend, uh, binge, oh, yeah. you know, three day binge, this would be a really good one to do. Um, Jen, final thoughts? Yeah, I agree. I, I enjoyed this show immensely more than I thought I was going to after the end of the first episode. And yeah, I, I liked it. Paul? Yeah, I totally agree. It was, this is the most interested I've ever been about chess in my entire life. <laughs> it, yeah. Netflix is making chess great again. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> All right. Well, for the majority of you, thank you so much for watching or listening to this episode, however you are consuming it. For those who are our patrons, uh, and if you want to be a patron, it's patreon.com slash show. But for those of you who already are patrons of the show, please stick around, and we are going to have another kind of tangential discussion on Netflix. Uh, it's not actually Netflix. It's HBO Max. Max. To the Max. To the Max. The Witches, which... Really, we wanted to do just because they're new releases for the for the first time. It's actually new content, so we wanted to kind of talk about both. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, we have a lot to say about the witches. Not a lot of it is great, <laughs> um, but uh, but please stick around and check that out. For everybody else, please uh, f- pl- find us on YouTube, um, find Out of Frame on YouTube, and also check us out on Instagram and Twitter. And we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.